Pastor John, thank you and hi everybody and a blessed new year to every one of you. I enjoy our time of prayer yesterday and I know God is going to spend, God is going to bless all our time together as we pray in the next few days and hear what the Lord have to say. I want to thank the AJPC and also the Malaysia United Firewall for organizing uh, this meeting and also to synergize to Together, I want you to know God is up to something, and we may not know, we may not understand what God is doing yet. But I believe God is going to speak to us. I believe God is going to lead us. I want you to know God loves Malaysia. Can you say a big amen? Not only amen. our Malaysia, but God loves the Church of Malaysia. And and I, I'm here not only to share God's word with you today, but also to pray along with you at the end of this service. But let us begin by prayer. Even as you pray right now, you can sense the presence of God. Even as you pray right now, reach out to God wherever you are on YouTube or, or in any other in any other online platform. Reach out to God right now. Father, I release your presence. I release your glory and you touch your people. Lord, you have always, oh God, gather your people in season, oh God, our prayer, just before you do something great and mighty and your people have obeyed you. They have come together and they have come to see your face. I pray right now, oh God, even right now, let your presence touch them, the Holy Spirit, let your glory touch them, activate the gifts of the Holy Spirit in them, open our ears, your God, even my ear, even as I share your word, to hear what you are saying, dear Lord, that we may hear it accurately. And Lord, we have, I pray, oh God, that this time will all, not only be a time to hear your word, but also, oh God, it will be a time of prophetic prayer with apostolic authority, oh God, and prophetic accuracy, oh Father. Lord, we thank you. You have said when we pray, we believe, we shall receive. Lord, we have prayed. The Malaysian church have prayed for many, many years, oh God. And Lord, we not only pray, and tonight we declare, we not only have prayed, tonight we declare, we believe, oh God. And Lord, tonight by faith, we receive the prayers, oh God. We receive the answer of our prayer, oh God. So Lord, we commit this time into your hands. I pray, dear God, that you will speak to us tonight, oh God, in a very definite way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to speak for a little while on the subject that is burning in my heart. And I have entitled this message, Reset. Reset. Our nation is in a chaotic situation, in a chaotic condition. Our nation is very disjointed. And our nation is very vulnerable to all kinds of influence. You do not need to be an avid reader to hear and to read what is going on. There are people that are just harmless, talking nonsense. But there are people who are bent in destroying our nation. There are people that are just uh, ignorant, not knowing what they are saying, commenting on things that they, that they are not aware of. But they are evil people that are bent in moving our nation backwards economically and in moving our and pushing our nation backwards politically and pushing our nation backwards in the freedom of religion. And I want you to know tonight, as a people, we declare that the work of the enemy will fail in the name of Jesus. Can you say a big amen? The work of evil spirit and the work of evil men will fail. So our nation is in that condition of chaos, very disjointed and very vulnerable. And many, not me alone, many, and some of you yourself, have even read about, have even said that we need a reset of the nation. Recently, I was watching a, a YouTube commentary of a very uh, well-known corporate figure. He was being interviewed by a very well-known YouTuber, and they were talking about the state of the nation. And this man, it's a very calibered man, a man who knows about economics, a man who comes from a very strong political background. Basically, what he's saying is 
our country need a reset. Our country need a reset politically. Our country need a reset uh, uh, economically. But tonight I want you to know before we can have a reset in our country, God wants his church to be reset first. Because the church is God's arm to bless the world. The church is God's glorious light to bring light to our nation. The church is God's salt to present and to preserve this nation. The community of faith it's God's answer to the needs. It's such a great thing to hear. And we thank Pastor Stephen for praying for all the flood victims. I want you to know the government is doing what they can, but it's such a joy to see and to hear about churches reaching out to the community. You see, before God can heal the nation, before God can reset the nation in every way, God needs to heal the church and reset the nation. For our nation, Malaysia, to arrive at her divine destiny, the church must first of all set herself into her own corporate destiny. I'm a strong believer that God in his wisdom is the one who draws the boundaries of the nation, like what the book of Acts say. I'm a strong believer in God's sovereign will, in God's sovereign timing, God in God's sovereign way. You are a Malaysia, and God, a Malaysian, and God has placed you in Malaysia for a time like this. I believe God is the one who formed the nation. And when God formed the nations of the world, God have a prophetic destiny for the nation. Malaysia is not only going to be strong economically, it's not only going to be strong politically, it's not only going to be strong socially, but through its strength, Malaysia will open the gates, the double gates of heaven and welcome the King of glory into our country and through our country to the nations of the world. Can you say a big amen? But before our nation, Malaysia, can fulfill her divine destiny, the church must fulfill her own corporate destiny as well before we can reset the nation, before the politician can do it, the church must first of all be reset. What is the meaning of the word reset? The word reset means to make new. It gives the idea of reestablishing. It gives us the idea of reconstruction or regathering. It gives us the idea of God doing something new. I want you to know God is doing something new. Not only in the assemblies of God, but in every denomination. I want you to know, even prophetically right now, if you think you know what God is doing, if I think I know what God is doing, God is going to surprise us because God is going to do far more exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask and think because of the power of God that resides in us and through us. Can you see a big hallelujah? If you think you love Malaysia, I want, to, I want you to know God loves Malaysia even more. If you think Malaysia have great potential, I want you to know God have greater potential in store for Malaysia. But before that can happen, God need to reset the church before he can reset the nation. I want you to turn with me for a little while to Ezekiel chapter 37, reading verse 1 to verse 14. I'm going to read, this is the word of God. We need to read the word of God before we expound. And the hands of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. And he causes me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, not few, very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And then God said to me, son of man, can this bone live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. And he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God to this bone, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you 
and I will bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bones to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath. No breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy now to the breath. Prophesy, O son of man, and say to the breath, thus saith the Lord, come from the four corners, O breath, and breathe on this slain that they may leave. And so I prophesy as he had commanded me, and breath came into them, and they leave and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army, underlying the word, they stood on their feet. And he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole, the entire, the complete house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. Our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus save the Lord of God. Behold, O oh my people, I will open your grave and cause you to come out from your grave and bring you into the land of Israel. That you shall know that I am the Lord. And when I have opened your grave, O oh my people, and brought you up from your grave, I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. When you begin to read Ezekiel chapter 37, many of us will understand it is a picture of what God will do to the nation of Israel that was totally broken. A nation loved by God, a nation highly esteemed by God, a nation that is being called the apple of God's eyes is now completely bankrupt, completely annihilated by the enemy. Their beautiful temple completely crushed by the love of God for his people never change. Can you see a big amen? I want you to know, recently somebody asked me, why are you a pastor? This is my 40th year in the same church. And I, I told that brother, there are many reasons why I'm a pastor. But I, I told him the greatest reason that I am a pastor, if I use my common sense, is, is to love the church. And God loved the church. And it's a great privilege to love something that God loves so much and died the church for. So tonight, as we come together and pray for a reset of the church, I believe God is hearing from heaven. And God is going to anoint our prayers. So this is the context of Ezekiel 37. God loving his people again and giving his people hope again. There are four specific steps that I want to quickly share with you as to how we can reset the church and bring the church to a place of strength so that we can enter into our own corporate destiny as a church. And in doing so, we can move our nation, reset our nation, to our nation corporate destiny. Number one, we must face the reality and the truth of the situation. I believe in prayer, and by the grace of God, I pray, and as much as I can, I join people in prayer, all kinds of prayer meeting. But I want you to know prayer is not the excuse for not facing the facts, for not facing the facts. Some people try to pray away the pain that they experience because they know the reality. And this is something that we must get into our spirit today. That if we are going to pray effectively, we cannot pray away that pain. We must face that pain and then pray so that the cause of that pain is resolved, is taken away. We must face the reality. The Bible says that Ezekiel was brought in verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 2, a valley that was full of bones. Verse 2, there were not some bones. There were many, many bones. And another version says they are dry and very, very dry. You must face the reality. The, re the reality must be there. We should not avoid it. We should not minimize it. We should not spiritualize it. And I want to ask a few very pointed questions few questions that I asked myself and I felt I should ask you. 
Ah, we, Malaysia, we boast of many great churches. Hallelujah. Our churches are well known around the world. Our pastors are not novices. They are well around, known well around the world. But the question is, are our churches producing disciples or just converts? In, in other words, do our people understand that hardship, self-denial is part and parcel of the Christian life? Or are we trying to explain it away and say, oh, because they are a different generation. If we are really the church, we must believe God that say that his word is transgenerational. God's word is applicable and God's demand is transgenerational. God's demand for us to carry our cross to be a disciple and not a convert is transgenerational. Is demand of any generation. Are we making converts or are we making disciples? I asked that of my own church this morning. I want you to know a lot of my own members are just converts. You don't need a word of knowledge to know it. You just need to see their commitment, their lifestyle. You just need to see the way they talk and the way they respond to the challenges. I'm being very honest to you because that's the truth. Metro is a big church, a mega church, but I can't really say they are many disciples. Ask yourself a question about the preaching of God's word. I'm a preacher like many of you. And many of you are great preachers. And recently, I read A.W. Tozer, a book that was about, that was never published, but it was published recently about him. And he's saying, he said, nowadays the message is not really important. The important thing is marketing presentation and performance and it's so hard to see the message because how it is dressed now i'm not against presentation i hope i'm making sense i'm not against performance i'm not against making sure our message is being uh, tra translated and transmitted but aw tozer many years ago made this statement he said in the last days people will look will come to church, to them, the message is not the most important thing. It is the delivery, it's the marketing, it's the presentation and performance that even though the preacher don't preach the whole counsel of God, even the preacher talk nonsense, it's still all right. And sometimes the message are very powerful, but people don't get it because people are so distracted by how we dress our message. Sometimes our personality are so strong and so good. Sometimes our, we are so eloquent. Sometimes we are so charismatic that the charisma of God's word never get across. If we want to reset the church, we need to face the reality and truth. Ask ourselves that question. A.W. Tozo talk about worship. Worship is a big thing. Thank God for today's worship. Pastor Gwen, well done. I felt God's presence in worship. A.W. Tozer in that particular book saying, the passion to be relevant is the God of the modern church. We will go a great land to prove that our message fit nicely with the culture around us. The passion to be relevant is one of the gods of the modern church. Is our worship just entertainment? Or entertaining, it should be, but is it just entertaining? Is it possible for a person to say he feels God and then just walk out of the service as if he has never seen God? Is it possible? Has the glory of God any influence on a person when a person worships God? Is, or is it just emotionalism? Is our worship really spirit-fused, spirit-empowered? Do our people really have a great revelation of God after they worship, when they sing, how great thou art, does it only numb, their, numb, uh, uh, numb them of their, of their fear? 
All those that song how great thou art impact their spirit that their God is indeed great. I don't know. All I know is not everyone in my own church is like that. Sometime in our quest to be relevant, it has become the God. It's just emotionalism, entertainment instead of a glorious God encounter. Are our people experiencing the amazing grace of God? The Bible tells us when darkness, when darkness rises, when darkness abounds, Romans chapter 5, the grace of God abound. But how are people really experiencing the amazing grace? Have you ever asked the question? I asked the question today. We talk about the grace of God that is all sufficient. Are there evidence that the grace of God that is all sufficient is really in operation in the life of our pastors and our church members. We have to ask ourselves honestly. But A. W. To it was it was not A. W. Tozer. It was another preacher that said, "It is hard to experience the amazing grace of God when we feel that we are so amazing." And this is one of the biggest God idol in the 21st century. Oh God, we are so important. We are so amazing. We tell our young people, we tell our children, you are so amazing. You're so smart. You are so good. I'm not saying we condemn them. I'm not saying we belittle them. But you see the amazing grace of God only works on sinist. The amazing grace of God only works on people who are totally bankrupt. To the, to the extent a person feels weak, that is the level of grace a person will experience the grace of God. Can it be that our people sing about it and never experience the grace of God. Could it be the reason why the, the evidence of grace is so low is because we have given our people the kind of accolade that deceive them. You cannot experience amazing grace when you feel that you are so amazing because the grace of God is only applicable for those who live under the wrath of God and those who cannot help themselves and those who are wretched. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Remember that song. Our, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, are we growing a kingdom of, growing the kingdom of God or are we just growing are we just babysitting a bunch of churchgoers that are always bored and never satisfied? We are, there are many of us who are pastors today. We lose people, we gain people. Our people go to other churches and other people come to our church. It's not the issue. But the question we have to ask ourselves in the presence of God tonight before we pray is, are we building the kingdom of God or are we just babysitting a bunch of believers that are always bored. You can never, never overcome their boredom. You have to give them the, a new soul. You have to give them a new way. You have to give them a new color. Jesus don't seem to be enough. When Jesus himself said, whosoever eat of me will never hunger again. Whosoever drink of me will never thirst again. And we as spirit-filled Pentecostal charismatic Christian should be the most satisfied people. We should be the kind of Christian that can thrive under any kind of situation, under any kind of church building, under any kind of music uh, form. You know why? Because we are always satisfied as long as Jesus is there. We don't need good music to satisfy us. We do not need a local preacher to satisfy us. We do not need a new song to inspire us. Jesus is more than enough. I'm sorry if I have troubled you. 
But that's the work of a preacher, isn't it? To stir us. We must face reality and the truth of a situation. Ezekiel, before I can change, before I can give you back the temple and enter the temple, before I can restore you, you need to see the reality because God's resurrection power only works on the dead, not on the half dead. God, Jesus was not half dead. Jesus' death and resurrection is the perfect example of how God brings revival. He was totally, mentally, emotionally, naturally, spiritually, absolutely dead. He was not half dead. No wonder he was resurrected. May God help us. May we pray tonight, especially for us preacher, like me and like many of us, that we will not gloss away the problems, but face the reality and the truth of a situation. Number two, the second step. I'm going to end soon so that we can pray. Hallelujah. Number two, we must declare the word of God and release the spirit of God. Verse four, God told him, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse nine, prophesy to the breath. And then in verse 12, he said, prophesy to the army. The army was there. The army was standing. And it's a picture of the church. The Bible says that there, it was a great army in verse 10 on their feet. And what did the army that was on the feet saying in verse 11? Our bones are dry. You can be an army and yet be dry. Our hope is lost. You can be an army and yet your hope is lost. And we ourselves are cut off. You can be, uh, be an army and be totally defeated. That's why God told them, told Ezekiel to prophesy now to the standing army. We need to preach the word of God without fear or favor. We need to remember, if you're going to do that, what Tozer said, that the message is not really important to this generation. The important thing is marketing, presentation, and performance. We need to remember what Tozer said, that the passion to be relevant is one of the gods of the modern church. Until, unless we destroy that God. Until, unless that happened, it's going to be very difficult for me, for you, and every one of us to study the word of God and declare God's word boldly without fear and favor. And even as Ezekiel prophesied, things began to change. And he prophesied specifically and make declarations specifically in three areas. In verse 5, he said, I will surely cause breath to enter you and you shall leave. Area number one, what does God want the church to become? The church does not, God does not want the church to be small. God does not want the church to be big. God wants the church to be alive. Amen. The church is not a corporation. I, I allow me to boast in the Lord for a while. I was just telling the church this morning, this we begin our 40th anniversary celebration. I told them the greatest privilege I have was the fact that 40 years ago, I started the church with around eight to 12 people. And we grew very slowly, very, very slowly through the years. We were small for many, many years. I understand the plight, the pressure, of the pastor. I was the pastor of a small church for a long, long time. I understand the plight and the pressure of church members who go to another church for conference and enjoy the great environment and ambience and come back home and see an, a, a hall that's reverberating, not because of soundproofing, but because the wall is too hot. Because of the echo, I understand that. But what does God want the church to be? 
to become, to become alive. Do not be ashamed of your small congregation if it's alive. Do not boast, even though you have a bigger church, if they are not alive. Because Jesus came to give life, and life is the proof that God is with us. He declared, what do you want to become? They want to live again. The second declaration is the vision. What does God want us to do? And that is the pur second purpose of our preaching and the release. What does God want us to do? Verse 10, God want us to be an army. Yes, an army. Take responsibility. Not run amok and do what we want, but together with proper kingdom protocol. Not walking around like foolish men talking about, oh, preaching the kingdom and declaring the kingdom and the king among us. When we all behave like rebellious renegades, not knowing rank and file, not understanding God prescribed ways of leading the kingdom. God's will is for us to be alive. God's vision is for us to be an army. It's a church army that will reset the nation, that will bless the world. It's the church armed with spiritual war, spiritual weapons through prayer that will defeat the powers of the enemy that want to destroy our nation. Our enemy, I repeat, is not man at all. We must love man. We must be humble before man. We must embrace man without any partiality. Our enemy is the devil. And the devil is a fighter. No wonder God told Ezekiel to prophesy and say, prophesy to them. Come alive! Prophesy breath over them so that they can be an army. And the third declaration and the third reason why we should preach and release the spirit of God is what was God's purpose? The Bible says in verse 10, they were a standing army. But in verse 12, the Bible tells, I will open the grave and cause you to come out from your grave and bring you into the land. God's purpose is for us to possess the land that the enemy has taken from us. Can you say a big amen? That is the purpose. Number two, we must declare the word and release the spirit. Number three, Hallelujah. Verse 7 and verse 8. And so I prophesy as I was commanded. So I preach and I release the Spirit of God. I preach under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I prophesy through the gift. And I, as I was commanded, and as I prophesy, there was a sound. And then suddenly a rattling. And then the bones came together from all over the place, bone to bones, finding their bones. And indeed, I look. The city began to come together. The flesh began to come over them and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Number three, we must persevere to see the process through. The miracle does not always replace the process. The miracle is the process. When he prophesied to the bones, the Bible says there was First of all, just noise, no life, noise, empty, nothing seems to be happening. And then after that, there was some wrestling around activities. Then after that, the bones begin to come together. And then after that, the covering of the sinew, the skin, and the soft part of the body began to come, to, to come together. And they begin to take shape. The miracle do not replace the process. The miracle is a process. The prayer movement in Malaysia have gone a long way. I know I'm going, I'm going to say this very, very carefully, but I will say thank you for accepting AGPC as part and parcel of the prayer movement in Malaysia. The prayer movement, we have the prayer united. We have the, is it boiling place or oven, boiling oven? I forgot all that. And then you got it. 
Malaysia Prayer Wall, the AGPC, and you've got the NECF Prayer Altar. There will be more. And what we need to do is to keep on keeping on. And sometimes we pray nothing happens. And sometimes we are deceived by what happened just because, just because the body is formed and just because the army is there, we think we are ready to conquer. Just like some people feel two years ago when there was a change of government and today they are absolutely disorientated and discouraged. Sometimes we are deceived by what we see. We, only God can seize the end. Only God can seize the end. Even prophets see only to a certain level and to a certain distance. Prophets are anointed by God. Prophets are not God. Prophets are anointed. Prophets are not the anointing. Only God knows. That's why we need to keep on persevering. Yeah, we rejoice when we see a bit of happening. We rejoice when we see the activity. We rejoice when he begin to take shape. And I declare to you even tonight, there will be more prayer movements that's going to, be, to spring out of this country. And it's not going to be only movement. There will be prayer houses. Churches are, begin to take, are going to, to rise up and take initiative. You're going to have to work with local churches. Local churches are going to spring up from all over the place and they are going to, they are going to be strong house of prayer and they're going to join you in prayer. And there will be a lot of others that will, that have never been part of this prayer movement. They are suddenly going to receive an anointing and an inspiration to rise up and pray. And some of them are going to be very funny. Can you imagine for a little while, one bone floating and going to the other end of the valley, trying to find his bones? the other bone to join. Some of them are going to look funny. Some of them are going to sound funny. Some of them are going to be, be even believe funny. Some of, can you imagine skeleton walking around? That was what happened. Before the sinew, before the, the skin, it was skeleton. If a skeleton is walking right in front of me, I will be freaking out. Can you imagine there would be people who are like that? They're going to be funny in their theology. They are going to be funny in their behavior. They are going to walk around since the whole world is on their shoulder and they're going to look very depressing all the time and they're going to weep all the time. Correct them. Love them. Help them. Hold their hands. Teach them. And be open. They may have something to teach us who have been praying for a long time too. We must persevere to see the process through. Malaysia will be safe. Hallelujah. Revival will come to Malaysia. Hallelujah. Can you say a big hallelujah in your own way? Hallelujah. But we will persevere to see the process through. A lot of people complain to me and say, a lot of young people are not in our prayer, in, in our prayer rallies. Persevere. Persevere. Push on. They will join you. They will suddenly realize that we cannot be the only one who is fighting for their future. They will suddenly realize they have to rise up and fight for their own future as well and the future of their own children. But you may have to deal with, you may have to hold your hands for a little while. I don't like that word, but anyway, you may need to be patient with their idiosyncrasies for a little while. You may have to bear with their nonsense for a little while and their recalcitrant attitudes for a little while. But they have some things to teach us too. We need to persevere and see the process through. Let me read a portion of scripture in the book of Hebrews. Chapter 6, verse 10, it says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love which you have shown towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister 
and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Malaysia will be reset because the church will be revived and reset. Can you see a big amen? Finally, the fourth step that we have to take. Verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say to them, to who? To the whole house of Israel, verse 11, who complain that our bones are dry and our hope is lost and we are ourselves. Who? Verse 10, to the standing army. What's the use of a standing army? A standing army does what? Stand. But prophesy and say to them, thus save the Lord. Behold, all my people, I will open your grave and cause you to come out from your grave and bring you into the land. Finally, we must be set free from all hindrances in our own life. There were a great army, a standing army, but it was a depressing, discouraged, hopeless, dry up, defeated army. Why? Because they were still standing in the graveyard of that valley. And God told them, I will open your grave and cause you to come out. Many people, many prayer movements that I know of around the world, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to work with them. And they have blessed me. But many, many, many nations, many break, many prayer movement never break through. Why? Because they did not get themselves free from the hindrances. Hebrews talks about the sin that easily beset us. We need to be alive and we need to be set free. And we should be angry with sin. We should be angry with corruption in our country. But we should not be angry at the people. We should not be bitter at the people. We should be angry at the amount of money that have been lost, be, that earn us that infamous word of being called a kleptocrat. But we should not be bitter. We have no right to be bitter with people. We are to love people. We are to be gracious with people. I know they are a lord of discouragement. I know they are a lord of uncertainty. We had a change of government two years ago. Then we have a backdoor government. Then we have another government. And now we're talking of a, about another government. And a lot of prayer movement that I know of, and I am not exaggerating, are somehow losing momentum. And one of the reasons is because we are angry, we are discouraged. I remember a few years ago, before this last election, many, I, I, many people believed that there was a change of government. I remember, and it didn't happen. And I remember I was sitting in the church and they, they have got an Australian woman who is an expert in political science speaking. And I was there. Uh, there was another bishop that was there and a few pastors were there. And I, I saw the tears coming down the eyes. I saw the discouragement. I saw a sister broke breaking down in front of me, crying. What has happened? We have prayed so much and it did not happen. We didn't know what to do. I was very sad myself. I fasted, I prayed. But two, of three years, three to four years later, I think it was around three and a half to four years later, there was a victory. There was a change of government. And then suddenly, two years down the road, there was a change again. 
we need to ask God to heal the hurts in our own heart, our own personal heart. Intercessors, you need to get that healed because if you don't have that healed, let me tell you right now, firmly, lovingly, you are going to be a hindrance. You're going to be a hindrance. You need to ask God to take away your pain, your hurts, your disappointment. And we need to come before God and commit our nation back to God and ask God to take control over again and realize that we are only servants of God. Only God can save our country. We can't. We need to be set free, not only personally, but also as a prayer movement. We need to have renewed faith we need to add more gusto to our faith. We need to be bold again. I've been attending the last few prayer meetings in a different, few different settings. It was so different from the previous one before the last election. Now we seem to be more cautious. Are we wiser? I think we are wiser. But could it be also because we've been hurt and disappointed? I'll tell you I am was hurt and disappointed. And I was wiser, yes, but definitely hurt and disappointed. I have to pray as a generous superintendent that God will heal me because if I, can, if I don't get healed as a generous superintendent, it's going to be very hard for me to cover and to encourage your AGPC and all of you who are praying along. I want you to know God will reset our country, but God will reset the church of Jesus Christ first. Let us pray. Come everybody. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the Lord, your God will even say tonight that the year 2022 is going to be a year of divine shift. And there is going to be shift not only in the nation, but there's going to be shift in the world, and there is even going to be shift even in the body of Christ. With the Lord saying, during this time of shift, let there be wisdom. Let there be wisdom for the enemy will come along the way, and the enemy will, will come along the way and take advantage of that shift and will begin to plant rebellion and plant anarchy within the shift. For the Lord say, I am not. I am not for anarchy. I am not for rebellion. So even as a, if I bring, even as I begin to bring the shift in the nation, in the church, and even as I begin to bring the shift into different ministry, the Lord said, be wise and be discerning. Do not be carried away and do not just, just listen to what people say and do not only see what uh, they have done, but seek me and know what is in my heart because I am the discerner of heart and I desire and I want to share with you the secrets of my heart. And it is not only going to be a time of shift. The Lord said this coming year, this year right now, is going to be a year of great grace. The people of God is going to experience grace like never before. And that grace will be manifested in strength. That grace will be manifested in joy. That grace will be manifested in confidence, say the Lord. And this grace will be manifested because my people will come to a place to seek me. My people will realize that they are completely dependent upon me and my people will not be afraid to be weak before me and the people will be my people will deliberately weaken themselves before me and when I see the weaknesses and the need for my people I will begin to pour this grace upon my people for the Lord your God will even begin to say that not only will this be a season of grace upon my people and a season of shift it will also be a season of prosperity for my people Prosperity because my people have been faithful. Prosperity because there will be a transfer of wealth even to, to some to, to my people because they have been faithful in their giving. They have been faithful to, in their tithing. They have been faithful in their serving. I will prosper them. But the Lord say that which I prosper should not be interpreted like the world. That which I that which I prosper will be felt by you as 
my prosperity over you. It will prosper your soul. It will not be measured by, num by, by numbers, but you'll be measured by the impact. Some of you may gain some money. Some of you may gain more money, but you will know it is the prosperity of the Lord because irrespective of the figures, you feel prospered in your soul. You feel strengthened. You feel blessed in your soul. And Father, I pray, oh God, tonight for this word that I have delivered from your word. I pray right now even for the prophetic word that has been released. Oh God, that you will bring it to pass in the name of Jesus. That you will give it the ear to hear what your spirit is saying. And Lord, I pray right now for the pastors and the leaders. Oh God, that all of us pastors and leaders, oh God, will find time, more time, oh God, will look for time and plan time to study your word and to pray. Father, forgive us as pastors and leaders that very often we, we allow a lot of very important things, oh God, to take our time, oh God, of studying scriptures, take our time for praying and seeking you, oh God. Help us to understand what it means, oh God, to delegate him, what it means, oh God, to leave the rest to others. Help us to understand what it means, oh God, to trust you to do what needs to be done by others so that we can commit ourselves to a life of prayer and also a life of studying of your word. I thank you, dear God, in Jesus' name. Amen.